Hi, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, or wherever you are around the world. Uh, welcome to this uh, Zoom and Facebook event hosted by the LOC Center for Women, Peace and Security together with our partners at the PRIO Center for Gender, Peace and Security, the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security, uh, the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping, Train Peacekeeping Training Center, and the Monash Gender, Peace and Security Center in Australia. Uh, my name is Sanam Naragi Andalini. I'm the director of the Center for Women, Peace and Security. And this event on the role of academia in realizing the promise of the Women, Peace and Security uh, agenda is something that we've been looking forward to for a long time, especially given that the 20th anniversary of uh, Resolution 1325 that's coming up this October. And, um, and I'm looking forward to conversation with my colleagues uh, around the world and with all of you who are joining us um, uh, online to really dig into where we've been, what's happened over the last 20 years, what are the challenges, uh, what else do we need to be doing within the academic um, uh, community in terms of linking with policymakers and, and, and practitioners, and very much looking at the question of how these issues resonate with the next generation of students and practitioners and policymakers that are coming through our institutions, but are but have grown, and there's there's a global community of people who are genuinely kind of committed to the, to this area of work. Um, and what is it that they need from academia and from research, and what is it that they can learn um, from us over the last twenty years of uh, uh, where we've gone right and where we may have wanted to do things differently, um, uh, and also where the challenges are genuinely of of how to you how you get research. In, into practice, in a sense, what the learnings that we have. So I'm, I'm very excited to start this conversation. Um, with me today, I have my colleagues, um, Jenny Klugman from the Georgetown um, uh, Center for Women, Peace and Security, uh, uh, Torin Turgestad from PRIO in Norway, Jackie True at, in, in Australia, and um, uh, Joanna, who's Joanna Ama Ose Tutu. Is that I, I hope I get it right um, from the Kofi Annan Center in Ghana. So uh, totally global and um, and very resonant with with the nature of this of this agenda. Um, ladies, welcome. Everybody else on chat and on Zoom and uh, on Facebook, welcome. We're going to have a, a conversation for about forty to forty five minutes. Um, and then we will open it up for uh, questions and answers. And we, what, we really welcome as many questions as people have um, so that it becomes a, a, a dialogue amongst ourselves. Um, but I'm gonna open it up with a, qu a question to all of you. Um, and Torin, I'll start with you, um, given Norway's role in this agenda for so many years. But uh, what was it that, what was the question or what was the issue that for you kind of was the entry into this world of women, peace and security. Um, what, what is it that sort of, as I say, introduced you to this and, and has made you a pioneer in, the, in this field? Mm. Thank you, Sanam, for, for the introduction and hello, everyone. Um, well, uh, it's a good question. I, I, I'm, I was thinking back as I was preparing for, for this event and, I, and I would really like to go back to my my, my studies. Uh, I was a student at the university in Oslo in the early 1990s. Um, my background is from, from political science, international relations. And when I'm thinking back during those years, uh, the majority of professors and assistant professors were men. We had hardly any uh, women scholars on our uh, reading lists. Uh, there were no lectures. Um, covering any topics that had to do with women or gender or gender perspective. And I remember already at that point, I felt a bit frustrated about this. And then when I uh, had my first job, um, immediately after leaving university, I was working on a project called Training for Peace in Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and there too, I was one of the very few uh, women associated with that initiative together with a couple of young women uh, among our partners in South Africa. Typically our role was to assist the men um, putting the program together for this series of workshops that we offered as part of this project. Uh, and it once again struck me that here we are offering workshops and seminars about the UN, about peace operations, how countries can prepare for contributing to peace operations, 
Uh, we are talking about uh, conflict analysis and there were no women in the room. Uh, there were no gender analysis and this in a region where women were so prominent, for instance, in the anti-apartheid movements. So for me, it became so obvious we need to do something. So that was where it really started. And I went back to the ministry in Oslo and said, listen, we should do something on gender. And the reaction there was, who are we to come and impose gender equality on the countries in the global south? And I was thinking, well, this is not about imposing anything. This is about common sense, about looking at what we can see on the ground and, and integrate this into the training and the research and the analysis that we are doing. So that's really my starting point in the early to mid 90s. That's yeah. It, it's it's interesting that it's for all of us, at least for me as well. It's that it's that period where you first start, and I, I love I love the point where you you say it's about you know you came from IR and politics. I came from anthropology, um, and and then entered IR. And I think that this is one of the, these fields where you can come at, at it from gender, from IR, from politics, mm -hmm. from development, from economics. But but there's this mo this aha moment for all of us. And mm -hmm. um and yeah, my my aha moment was sitting in a room with. 50 women from around the world talking about war and peace and and what they were doing and same thing thinking they are literally absent from the contemporary discussions from the history from um it, they're just taken for granted no one's actually paying attention to what they're doing on the ground and and what their roles are so and that that and the courage that it takes to become you know peace builders um and how we're just not recognizing that, right? And and so so it, it, it becomes this this kind of personal, but also um, um, uh, intellectual and emotional um, sort of uh, drive. I, I think, um, Joanna, from from the standpoint of your work um, in in Ghana and with the Kofi Annan Institute, um, what was it that brought you in into this world? I mean, you you work on maritime piracy, you work on a variety of things with the security sector, but what is it that sort of got you going um, and, and committed um, in, in this sector? Well, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all those joining us globally. Um, I have been thinking about this question and I have been trying to figure out what got me into this field. And honestly, um, uh, it comes from my childhood. I came from a family that had um, three girls and a young man, and um, my brother was the eldest went to school very early in to boarding house at the age of 10. So from as child, as kids, we had three girls who had to do everything. And I remember my mom always saying, when we always complain about things, she always say, so who should do it, your dad? You can't ask your dad to do it. So from as early as we were kids, we did everything, wash the cars, mow the lawn, move everything. And then growing up, I realized not all the girls in my class, as I went up in school, were exposed the same way that we did. They weren't allowed to do the things that we took for granted as it's normal, it's normal. And as I found myself moving into other fields, I, I mean, I, I'm an English student. I did English in my undergrad and I went to do development cooperation and then I was exposed to security issues and then I, I came to Kofi Annan. And I remember in 2011, I started doing research into protection of civilians. And I spent time in Liberia and in DRC, and I was doing work into protection of civilians. And we we're trying to develop a training course on protection of civilians. And the more people I spoke to, then they always spoke about the fact that the victims were women and children. But everyone I spoke to who were doing interventions for these victims were men. And I kept asking them, but where are the people? I mean, the, the majority of the victims were women. But the people who were planning the interventions for these victims were the men. And I kept asking, but who, I mean, you are planning intervention for people, but the people planning the interventions don't look like the victims. And I, and I asked them, don't you see a problem with this? Don't you, can't you see a gap in this whole process that those who are affected are not here to talk about their problem? Do you, don't you see the gap in this whole thing? Don't you see a problem with what is happening here? And I remember, the, I mean, I remember in DRC when people kept using the same phrase over and over again. They use rape as a weapon of war. They use rape as a weapon of war. And it hit me and I said, why would anyone see rape as a weapon of war? And that was the first time that phrase became meaningful to me, that someone would see rape as a weapon. 
And I mean, I've heard it over and over again, but that was the first time it really hit me in a way that I couldn't sleep at night. And it, it became impactful. It, it really kept me up at night that, that weekend, that week in DRC. And that was when I said we needed to begin to prepare. And I, and I came back to KIPTC and I asked myself, how do we prepare our peacekeepers to be able to deal with this? And many of them said, we go into the field, we hear the stories and it hits us. We have people, I mean, we, we are not able to provide some kind of comfort to these women and to this, even some of these men and these children. And we are not prepared enough for the stories we hear. We're not prepared enough for the, the trauma these people, these victims have gone through, these survivors have gone through. And so the question that we ask ourselves, how do we prepare our peacekeepers to go out in the field and be able to address and the atrocities these, these survivors have gone through. And that was the, as you said, the aha moment for me. How do we use our center as a training center to prepare the, our peacekeepers to be able to provide some, some kind of solace, some kind of comfort, something for the survivors of, the, of, of, of rape or, or, or the survivors of atrocities that, that these changing nature of conflict are proposing to, to the civilians in the field. And that for me was slowly beca became the changing point or the changing nature for me into this field. Yeah. Thank you, no, it, and, and I, again, it really resonates. I, I for me personally, I remember, I remember in 1996, um, we were doing policy issues around conflict prevention and early warning and, and ar around this beginning to dig into these kinds of the nature of war and the weapon, the wep you know, this rape is a weapon of war and reading the human rights reports from the Bosnian rape camps. And, you know, you, you read something, you don't know what you're about to read, but it suddenly, it goes into, I mean, it, 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 was, it was secondary trauma. And, and, and I think that's actually part of something that maybe we need to be also talking about that, you know, we know things that sometimes you, do, you wish you didn't know, or you wish you could unknow, um, but it's out there. And, and, and I think that's another thing that once you know it, you think it's got to change, you've got to stop it. So how do we do that? And then the first, you know, this question of why doesn't it stop or why, why, why aren't there, you know, what do we need to do with our institutions? But I, but, but I think your, your point is right. And it's this idea that the peacekeepers themselves also hear these stories and, um, and they need some kind of capacity to be able to deal with it themselves. I, th I think that that's, that's a great point. Um, Jackie, what about you? For you, what, what was the starting point? I remember at one point when, when we had, when we were talking in the prep, you said you were, you remember the days of writing letters in, in longhand and, and posting them to people uh, uh, for research. So what, what was it that kind of brought you into this world? Thanks and, and good evening, good morning to you, Sanam, and uh, good afternoon to everyone else. Um, yeah, well, I have to go a bit further back than the letter writing in the early 90s. Um, I actually joined the anti-nuclear movement where I grew up in New Zealand. Um, and at the time, and there was like over 300 peace groups in the country um, that led to a significant change in the government adopting a nuclear free zone. So that was like, I came of age in that era and I joined that movement. And um, so that was hugely inspiring to understand you know, to have your prime minister debate at the Oxford Union uh, against the case for nuclear deterrence and uh, to refuse US nuclear ships in your harbor, to have uh, Greenpeace's rainbow warrior boat bombed by the French in your own country. So things like that had a huge impact and, and why I really was passionate about peace and security. But I guess being part of that movement, what really drew me into a gender perspective was the, um, the move by the government to remove the combat exclusion for women in the military. And from the peace perspective, the first article I ever wrote with two other activists was titled Equal to Kill. Are women equal to kill? And at the time, although, I mean, who is going to oppose the extension of equality? We wanted to really challenge that perspective, the, that male standard of equality, that somehow to be a full citizen, you needed to be able to kill, you needed to be able to wield weapons, you needed to be able to resolve conflict, um, you know, through, you know, your participation uh, in a defence force. Um, and so I, I you know, it's really interesting. Recently, I started watching during lockdown here in Melbourne, uh, the Mrs. America TV series, which uh, has uh, Kate Blanchett in Australia and play the lead 
uh, Phyllis Sheffley. And in that it's really interesting because the conservative women are horrified by the idea of women in foxholes. Uh, that that would be the end of civilization if women became like men and joined the military or got drafted. And so we were never Phyllis Schlafly's down and down under, um, but we did want to really challenge this, this notion of, of militarization and military security. And we were in a country, quite frankly, that didn't have much of a military anyway. Um, but certainly we wanted to open up a debate about gender, peace and security. We wanted to encourage nonviolence and we wanted to think about alternative approaches to defence. And feminism and peace just seemed to collide. And of course, you know, there's a historical tradition there. It's the letter writing came a bit later because we didn't get emailed quite late in the piece. And I'm, I'm about the same age as Torun. So uh, not a, the, my male lecturer said, oh, you should write some letters to those women in the United States. Uh, you know, probably the counterparts to Phyllis Schlafly. It, it's fascinating because it's this, I mean, I, I growing up in um, the Iranian revolution for me was also this sort of moment where I was like, look at where the women are and look at where the men are. And then, and, and it continues, there's a sort of continuity. But, grow, but back when I was in England in my teens, we had the um, uh, Greenham Common Women and the anti-nuclear movement. And they were portrayed as crazy ladies. You know, it was these crazy feminists, God knows. I mean, it was just such a negative sort of, literally the media and everything about them. And yet it was, it was you know, what they were saying and what they were doing was absolutely, um, you know, prescient and important and, 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 and so forth. And your point about the, the women in the military, you know, in the last few years that I've been here in the States, um, I remember the day that they said, you know, we're gonna have women for combat troops for, you know, it's gonna be opened up. And thinking that's great for the equality agenda. That's not the same as the women peace and security agenda, because, you know, our, my, my version of equality is that I really don't want our boys having to go and kill and be killed and maim. And, you know, it's, we actually don't want anybody going off to war. Um, not necessarily that we want you know, we want equality in the status quo, but it's an interesting sort of dichotomy and some of the tensions that we have around um, the different parts of the global uh, sort of feminist movement and, 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 the, and the polls, put pushes and pulls. But, but thank you, that, that, that's, really, that's really fascinating. Um, uh, Jenny, from, from your perspective, you come at it from a, with a background in economics, you were at the World Bank. Um, what is it that sort of brought you into this sort of space of women, peace and security, which is, you know, overlaps, but also quite different to some of the more traditional um, work around gender and development. Yes, and um, you're right. Um, I don't have a security or an IR or a or a background in in anthropology. I was much more on the on the economic and and legal side, and I went into working on human development and poverty reduction, and did that for many years. Um, at the UNDP as well as at the World Bank, although in a number of contexts uh, severely affected by conflict. So South Sudan, Sudan, Darfur, Cambodia, uh, typically more on the post-conflict side, you know, not in the midst of you know, peace negotiations um, and, and the worst of um, conflict effects, but very much having to deal with the drivers of conflict as well as kind of recovery. So a sharper focus on women, on gender, tackling gender inequality, especially among marginalized women was I think very much a natural evolution. And so I was very happy to take up the opportunity to work with Milan Vervier at Georgetown. And just to say briefly, one of the things that still most attracts me to, to women, peace and security is the diversity of issues um, and, and disciplines and people who are working. And I think that, you know, we each bring, I think, somewhat different takes, some with much more um, depth in terms of understanding at the grassroots, some of us kind of more on the policy side, like myself. Um, and I think that trying to work out ways of um, kind of enriching the discussion and, and advancing the field is one of the aspects which really distinguishes uh, women, peace and security. Thanks. Thank you. No, and I, and I, th I think that's a great segue in, into the sort of conversations around um, academia because it is so multidisciplinary, and and it, it's as you say. I mean, we've all just just between the the five of us, we've come at it from different um, not only disciplines but also different kind of institutional backgrounds or kind of career backgrounds. But but it's it's a space that allows for this this richness, and and I think it's 
in a way, it's more reflective of the reality of the con of, of the context that, that you're talking about. You, as you say, you can't go to South Sudan and not think about economic development or not think about political governance. Corrupt, you know, it, it's um, or not not think about the differences for women, men, and women. I mean, it's it's all it prompts these questions and allows us the sort of the the um, freedom to to look at it from from, from different angles. So. Um, it makes the field complex, but also fascinating, I, I think, is, is, uh, is one way of thinking about it. Um, so if we, again, if, if we sort of look at it just historically, you know, in 1995, we get the Beijing Platform for Action. Really, for the first time, we get uh, Chapter E in the Platform for Action, which is on women and armed conflict. So it's like, it was actually a new topic that came, came about. Um, because of the wars in Bosnia and Rwanda, but also because of the peace activism in Northern Ireland and, and Israel-Palestine at the time and, and Guatemala. So the, the question of participation and protection kind of comes into the global discourse, if you want. And then, and then we have the activism, and I was involved in it, and many of you were, in terms of getting the resolution, getting, you know, getting us again in this sort of political security, sort of institutional space with, with Resolution 1325. My own recollection of, at the time of trying to do research in these areas of, you know, um, you, UN Women or UN, UNIFEM at the time um, commissioned me to, to, to research what women's, what difference it makes to have women at the peace table. You know, what, what experiences do we have? I mean, if you Googled or you, whatever we did in those days um, in terms of research, it was very easy. There was very little li literature back then on any of, on so many of the topics, you know, you'd come across some, one thing here or there, but, um, and, and so we've, we've been at the forefront of creating that literature. All of you have been in there as well. And 20 years on, I think if you Google, there is a mountain of material. And maybe for a lot of people, it's actually really difficult. I mean, for, for the next generation, where do they even start? But the, fundamentally, my question right now is, um, what, have we, what is it that we've achieved so far? If we want to reflect back, what is it that, what are the sort of some of the big um, moments of saying this is this is something that we've collectively done in terms of knowledge and research and 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 contributions to the development of the field and the connections between the field as a sort of area of academic um, scholarship, but also in terms of its uh, applied work. Um, uh, uh, Jackie, I'll start with you. What 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 do you think are some of the sort of big big uh, achievements that 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 we have thus far? Mm -hmm. Um, thanks, Sanam. I mean, I, I think that um, I'm going to say something kind of amorphous, first of all. Um, I actually think it relates to what, exactly what Jenny said. I think it's just incredible, the global movement or what, we, what I might call a community of practice and theory that we have created under the guise of 1325 and Women, Peace and Security. I mean, what other resolution has born such a network um, and such a diverse network. So if I think about now, like, you know, when we were, set, were talking earlier about late 80s, early 90s, I had to write hand mail letters to feminist scholars of international relations. I mean, we, I can pick up the phone and talk to someone in defense about gender, peace and security in Australia. Um, I can call out to my friends from Women's International League for Peace and Freedom all around the world in different conflict affected contexts. Um, you know, we know our ambassadors, we actually have ambassadors for gender equality and we are connected. I have 200 undergraduate students studying gender and international relations this semester. So we, It's to, you know, to the grassroots, but we're actually connected and that is a fantastic achievement and one which it doesn't point to any specific achievement, but one which is so enabling for so many in, in many different contexts and I think just many achievements. In terms of the contribution of academia and all of us here and the centres that we represent, um, I just want to highlight two kind of, I think the kinds of collaborations that we've been part of um, in helping to build um, and inform uh, the policy making and the advocacy. Um, I would say, first of all, I think um, the research around women's participation and peace processes and post-conflict recovery is really critical. And I'm really excited and happy to have seen 
um, so many contributing to that. And most recently, um, the collaboration at Monash that we've had with the political settlements program at Edinburgh uh, and, and inclusive peace um, in Geneva on this peace fam app really providing very translating our research in a very concrete way to first of all to mobile phone you know women activists in middle east and north africa to enable them to learn from strategies uh, to understand the provisions and agreements around the world that have got up and how they got sustained and how they got used and and you know we're going to continue to build on that but that's really exciting not just to um to uh you know to have provided evidence to, to ac other academics, but to actually provide evidence that can empower women uh, and peace processes um, right now. And the second area I would just mention, um, it's also really, you know, it's, I think it comes off the back of so much work that's gone on before, but I think the work that a number of us are doing, and I, and not only at Monash, but I also point to my colleagues in, in, in Sweden, Eric Melander and uh, Ellen um, Bjarngard, looking at how sexist attitudes actually matter uh, um, for support uh, and participation in political violence and violent extremism. So that sexism, uh, and misogyny are actually key features distinguishing those people, both men and women, who are likely to enact violence, conduct violence uh, against civilians from those people who are not. Uh, and I think, you know, that like we're only just getting headway there, but if we can convince more people on the ground, you know, more policymakers, but also more of those development practitioners that this actually matters in the kinds of ways you want to go about preventing and countering violent extremism and terrorism, then I think in the next decade, um, I, I really truly believe, um, you know, a gendered approach to that is, is going to make a huge difference. And I think we can only make, you know, have you done that research? Yeah, so I, I'm really excited about that. And I think it, it builds on so much that's gone before. That's 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 uh, that's I, I completely um, agree with you. I, th I think the collaborative way in which this field has evolved and across not only across geography, but across these different levels. I mean, you know, it's we, I, we have a network of grassroots activists and, and I've been in places. I remember um, in 2010 being in Sri Lanka doing a workshop and a police officer from the north of the country said that 1325 was the most important resolution it was the most important policy document from him. I mean he was a police officer you know um, from Jaffna saying this and I was like why do you say that and then he started talking about um, this question of the kinds of violence and gender-based violence and how they're dealing with it and how they've how for them it's a big issue in terms of community security so it's fascinating how it resonates and I think it's because it came from the ground up so, so it really was a moment of weaving our worlds um, together and um, and Torin, we we do well now. Now with uh, with COVID, it's it we had to cancel them. But the trainings that we do together for UN policymakers. I mean, that question of um, when when we have a moment to be able to give them the research and the findings and the sort of the conceptual framing, but also the evidence base, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. Do you see in your interactions? that it begins to shift mindsets does it does that it opens up attitudes and and as they you know come in and walk out you know has it made a difference um that bringing the research to the policy space i, I would definitely say yes uh i think there's been a major change um and maybe uh, more so in in recent years um as, as you said I, i've been PRIO is, a, is a, an independent research institute, so we are not an academic institution in the sense of being a, like a university, but being an independent research institute, we are also working quite closely with, for instance, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Oslo, and do a, quite a bit of a more applied research. So, so we have had a close dialogue with policymakers over years, not only in Norway, but also in the UN system. And we can clearly see now that there, there seems to be, what should I say, like a hunger for more data, um, uh, more information, more, more uh, research-based knowledge. And, and we can also see that this is increasingly also integrated into policymaking. If you look at 
various policy documents like national action plans, the global study uh, on women, peace and security that was launched in 2015, it was full of references to research. And, and if we go 10 years back, that was not really the case. And also the most recent national action plan produced by, by the Norwegian government was full of references to, to research. And, and at least in my dialogue with, with the diplomats, they don't, they don't want any longer to base their policy on assumptions, they want evidence. So this is where I think that we can play an important role. Uh, and this also leads me back to your question, where, where, where have we made the biggest difference or what are the greatest achievements? I think, and I agree with what you said, Jackie, that this has become such a community, big community of practice. And one of the major achievements is that this has become a field in its own right. And it's been taken seriously. When we started out, you know, all, all of us in the 90s and early 2000s, I mean, the general feedback we got was, oh, this is anecdotal. This is unscientific. Uh, but I think we have evolved now and we have focused a lot on doing proper research. Some are doing qualitative research, others are doing quantitative research. We have focused a lot on educating new generations of students. We have now also here in Norway, a number of PhD scholars uh, about to submit their thesis. Uh, so it has really become a community of practice. And one more thing I, I think has been very important is that we have raised new topics on the agenda and securitized it. For instance, sexual violence in non-conflict. When I, my colleague Inge Schelsbeck started out in the 90s, uh, she was told that this is a topic that you cannot research because it's too sensitive. You cannot research sexual violence in armed conflict. And also it's not a security issue. And where are we today? This is a thriving, really flourishing research agenda where you have so many scholars and they are publishing books and, and articles in prestigious um, journals and, uh, and uh, publishing houses. So I think we have achieved really a lot in a very short time of period. Thank you. No, I, I, I completely uh, agree with you, and I and I think it's it's amazing because I, when 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 we got resolution eighteen twenty, which sort of went deeper into the sexual violence question, it was it it was we kind of put a stake in the ground with thirteen twenty five, but eighteen twenty came. I remember I was sort of giving back channel um, text as they were as negotiations were going were going on. And trying to put in the terms that men and boys are victims of sexual violence as well. And um, Libya was on the Security Council at the time and they refused. And so we had to, they, they would accept women and girls, and they would, and so we had to gender neutralize. So it was, we would, you know, it, was, it became civilians and people. But it was fascinating how once we got the language around women and girls, then there was, then a lot of men came forward and said, but men are also victims of, of this kind of sexual violence. Um, and and so and it and and I used to say, but you know, for three thousand years, the guys could have talked about these things. They chose not to. It's when women came and started talking, and then the, the, they they were like, yes, us too. And and it's really enriched our understanding of how these horrific forms of violence are are, are used. And, and Joanna, I want to come back to, to to you in terms of again, as someone who's um, come into the field, it is you're, you're you're working with security actors. How do you see? the body of knowledge and evidence and research, you know, coming from academia and, and, and uh, um, the field, as, as, as Torin was saying, how does that help in your work at the Kofi Annan Center? Well, I mean, um, for us at the KIPTC, one of the things we always say is that our training is backed by research. Mm -hmm. So we just don't turn up from training programs. We ensure that all the trainings we, 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 we deliver is research-based. So we, as I said earlier on, I said, we, we, when I was doing my, my we developing our training course for protection of civilian, I was out in the field doing research. So we, we definitely place a premium on research. We make sure that every training we deliver is based on research, identifying the gaps on research, seeing where the, the gaps are, and then using that research and translating that into um, the training programs. And that is basically because we want to ensure that every training that we do has some theoretical basis and it's not just because we feel there's a gap somewhere but we want to ensure that we we, we give up some um, trainings that has evidence base and it's and when you're dealing with security forces and you have people who are very 
entrenched in the way they do things. It's a system that they operate. It's very systematic. And it's something that they are comfortable with. You want to be able to present to them evidence-based research that is concrete. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I am saying that this is what is happening. The evidence is saying this. The evidence is proving this. And this is what we have found from our field. And so when you are presenting this to them, there is no way you can say no. We have evidence to prove what we are saying to you. And we have evidence to show that this is what is coming from the field. And as you said earlier on about um, Libya, not, I mean, the men saying this is also happening to boys. When you tell, especially when it comes to violence, and we are saying, yes, it's not just women and girls who are being victims to sexual violence. When you are out in the field and you are looking for victims of sexual violence, the conversation of the fact that men and boys may, may also be victims. And you have the men say, no, we say, no, our research is proving this. And you have some people say, no, and you say, oh, based on the evidence we have gathered and the research that we have done, we have evidence to prove this. And we can then present the research to them and say, this is the research we have done. This is the findings from our research. And we can, pre we can present this to them. Mm -hmm. And we can show this and say, this, are the, this, is what we got, this is the data we have gathered. And when this is presented, then you have very little to, to contest in that sense. So research goes a long way when you are training some categories of persons because it, it backs up what you are saying in class. It backs up the training you are providing. And it, it, it helps to convince, yes, a lot of time is attitude. It's, oh. it, it, it's a culture, yeah. but you can change attitude at times with evidence. Yeah, and I'm gonna and so come back I'm going to come back to this question of this, uh, this, the attitude, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll come back to that because I think, I think we really, it would be really interesting to dig down into this. Um, Jenny, from the Georgetown Center, I remember when, you know, we were lobbying or advocating here to get the, what became the first de facto national action plan, you know, uh, OMP and Security National Action Plan here in the U.S., and then on the back of that, the, the Georgetown Center, um, the Georgetown Institute was, was, was uh, inaugurated in, in, uh, 2010, I think it was 2011. Um, having what's the you know having a center in an academic in in a university context. Um, how has that? What difference does it make? What difference does it make to have this place where where and and being the first one? And uh, I think you guys were the first one, right, Jackie? It, Monash came later. Um, in terms of in terms of the sort of the the center, but I, I think Georgetown Institute was was kind of. Was a pioneer and, and uh, as as a bringing this and and, and recognizing it. Um, what difference did it make? And at the same time, the, the other flip side of the coin: What if we hadn't? If what if we hadn't put that stake in the academic space as a you know institutional structure? Where would we be if we didn't have the centers that we have right now? Thanks, Sanam. Um, well, I think it partly goes back to a number of the themes that Jackie already raised about connections. Um, and I think that having a connection were indeed an institutional home, you know, within a large and established university like Georgetown clearly has advantages. And I think that the convening um, presence of Georgetown has been something which has been very successfully kind of pursued over the last several years, obviously now on a virtual basis. Um, but I think um, that has been an important part of kind of bringing various decision makers, including people with you know, views that you don't necessarily agree with, um, as well as pioneers and people working at the grassroots um, to the table and providing a platform, I think has been very important. And then connecting that with the evidence and the research, which a number of uh, my colleagues have already highlighted, you know, the importance of bringing, bringing that to bear. Um, and then just, I guess, one quickly, one final thing I just wanted to mention here was actually, is actually joint work we've done with PRIO, uh, trying to bridge the silos of work, because clearly at a university as elsewhere, you know, the silos become very apparent. You know, we're sitting in the School of, of Foreign Service, but there are a number of different groups within the School of Foreign Service and also more broadly. Uh, working on security, working on development, working on economics, not necessarily kind of working together. So together with PRIO, we developed a, an index ranking uh, women's rights and well-being around the world uh, for 167 countries, um, capturing inclusion, justice and security, I think in a way which was simple and tractable um, and which allowed kind of for a larger, I guess, public um, more accessible way of understanding some of the key themes that we're thinking about um, 
and bringing different issues together, which we're now doing in depth for the 50 states of the US uh, that we're going to release in October. So I think kind of the interactions uh, on these various fronts have all been very important. Thank you. That that's that that's great. And I'm and it kind of brings me into the next set of quite you know uh, obvious question, which is that um, 20 years, so much has been done, um, but when we look at some of the fundamental practices, they're still not changing, right? So um, I found a, a video of myself um, from 20 years ago saying, you know, we need to have women at peace table and here's the evidence that we have and, 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 and building on that evidence over the years and then all the statistical evidence that came out and so forth. And yet next, you know, whether tomorrow or next week sometime, we have the Afghan peace talks. And, um, you know, if we're lucky, there'll be three women um, uh, present there uh, as part of the Afghan delegation, not as genuine, you know, not necessarily representing a sort of a, the voice of um, uh, an independent voice of, of, of peace builders. If we talk about sexual violence and conflict, um, uh, how much have we done based on, again, the research, the recommendations, all the kinds of the work that everybody's done, how has it actually changed the attitudes to shift the practice? Um, you know, and, and, and so, so where, you know, if we think about that, the challenge, um, is it our responsibility within, within academia and in, in scholarship to shift the way that we do things different, you know, th that we draw knowledge and, and pass it on? Or um, what's next? How do, how do we really bridge that gap between what we know that needs to be done, what's going wrong, and um, getting it done right? And I don't, I mean, I don't know any other I'm not very familiar with many other fields, but I can't imagine medicine or um, even other sectors of development being so dependent on individuals' attitudes, right? I, that, that, as you said, Joanna, that it's, you know, you may, any of us may have be experts, but, but literally sometimes we have to turn around and say, it don't listen, it's not me, it's the evidence, as if, as if you as an expert don't count, right? So, so, so I'm just curious, it's like, what's the challenge and where, you know, how do, where do we think we need to take it um, next so that, you know, in five or 10 years time, we're, we're still not having the same, these kinds of issues of the, on the ground that the, the reality hasn't quite changed. Um, Torin, I, I, what are your thoughts on this? Um, and I know it's a big, big question, but I'm just like, when, when you sit and you, you think this is great and then, oh, why can't they do it? What, what, what is it that, that you wish would be different? Well, uh, as a person, I'm op I'm optimist by nature. <laughs> so, so uh, although we've been struggling now for for so many years to to really, I mean, be taken seriously, um, I'm I'm still optimistic. And and the main reason why I'm optimistic is that I'm approached by so many young people um, mm -hmm. of all genders uh, are, who are interested in working on these topics. And I'm thinking that the students of today are the policymakers, the peace envoys, the peace facilitators uh, of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we see all these changes taking place uh, in educational institutions like Monash and Georgetown and, and, and the Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Training Center. I mean, every institution involved in teaching and training, if they want to be well-respected, if they want to be modern, they are now offering various courses at different levels, bachelor's, master's, and PhD on these kinds of topics. And I, I, I'm, I'm convinced that this has, this will have an impact. We, we, we will be able to change the minds of the young generation that will be the policymakers and the peace facilitators uh, of tomorrow. So, so in that respect, I'm, I'm, I'm really optimistic. And also what, what we are trying to do at PRIO, uh, we are strongly committed to, to uh, knowledge dissemination, mm -hmm. that all the research that we are undertaking should be brought out there to the public. We don't just publish and leave it. Um, and we organize a lot of events. And what we try to do when we organize seminars and conferences and workshops is that we always bring together not only scholars, but Policymakers, we bring together people working in the big civil society organizations in Norway, including some who are really big on the international scene too, in terms of providing humanitarian assistance and what have you. And, and this is uh, the dialogue we then have uh, is really interesting and fertile and the exchange that is taking place when we br are bringing all these different mm -hmm. groups of people together 
is so useful and, and I'm, I'm convinced that this will contribute to a change if, if not tomorrow then in a not too distant future maybe I'm too optimistic but I like to to think that it, change is possible yeah no I, th I think I think that's I think I think you're right and I again I, I've seen you know when I used to say when people would ask me what do you do and I would explain they would just look at me quizzically and now when I say it they're like, oh, that's awesome. What can we do to help? You know, so I think there's also a shift in public attitudes that that yeah. that, that we're beginning to, to see. But um, but it's still there is there is still that question of you know, call, you know, people who are at the forefront of being able to make change that they're not necessarily and, and so yeah, so so how do we get that going? Jackie, what do you think um in terms of um challenges and, and what we need to do? Um what, whether whether there's anything that we need to do differently, or or you know how do we do it differently um, um, to try and get the shift? Is it is it or is it you know why should it be on us um, as opposed to the practitioners? Um, yeah, I'm an I'm an optimist like Toron. <laughs> um, I um, I do think there's a key role for for academics and researchers, and I I think um, Toron put his finger on it. It is about supporting the leadership of the next generation. Um, it is about scaling up the knowledge and the capacity uh, for achieving gender equality um, and inclusive peace and security. Um, and that involves all of the work that all of us are doing in terms of training the next generation, but also training the practitioners and the diplomats and the military um, and it's so exciting to be able to do that and to, to see the willingness and the great interest of people in all of those institutions to do their jobs better, because I think they too are also committed to building peace and security uh, mm -hmm. and finding better ways to do it um, and, and, and to be more inclusive um, in their own operations as well. So I think, uh, I think we're assisting a great deal. And of course, there's always so much more that we can do. Um, my view is that, you know, achieving uh, gender equality, inclusive peace and security is the longest revolution. It is a revolution. Changing minds and attitudes is the hardest thing. Sometimes it's easier to change the behavior and require the behavior change than to change the minds. Um, but I think there are some things that we can do. And when we were discussing this webinar, I think a week ago among ourselves, we talked about you know, building our political skills, becoming more politically savvy and strategic. Um, and I think, um, and encouraging our students um, and those we're mentoring to also become strategists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's key. What I'm seeing now with even my own students is some amazing capacity at communication um, and at building alliances. And they have the technology and the technical now to be able to do this. In the last uh, couple of weeks, my students have been making two minute videos uh, showcasing the argument. Yeah, they've been making uh, two minute videos um, showcasing the argument that uh, gender equality, gender inclusive peace is sustainable peace. And I'm telling you, they are the most fantastic videos I have seen. Um, I, I'm like, my God, what have I got to teach these young people? Um, so I'm really optimistic there. Um, but I do think this political analysis is important. And why is it important? Because we are living in an era with great polarization in all our societies. And I worry that even as we see the successes and achievements of women, peace and security, um, and together also perhaps more recently, this feminist foreign policy movement, we also see the rise of really extremist uh, political parties and movements. We see hyper-masculine leadership and in a way more hyper-masculine, you know, than when women weren't also uh, rising in their political leadership. So I think in this kind of a context, we need to, we need to, you know, win friends and influence people and become much more politically savvy. And that's something that we need to focus on in our universities, in our training programs, not only how to, how to bring the evidence to bear, but how to make really persuasive arguments that, um, that really touch people's, you know, hearts and minds. 
That's, you know, it, it's interesting. And, I, and I'm just, um, um, as, as we look at these challenges and, and what, what we see as opportunities, one of the questions that, that, that came up in the, um, in the chat box, and, and uh, uh, Jenny and Joanna, I'm just wondering whether, you, whether you'd be interested in answering this. Um, somebody says, you know, how can academia avoid the trap of the echo chamber? And how are they, you know, what are they doing to talk to the skeptics about gender equality? And I, my own sense is, is that, um, you know, I wonder whether we are allowing the handful of skeptics to dominate um, discourse and practice far too much. And because, because we see, so when, when you bring these things out in the public, you see how much interest there is. But the fact is that, that, that there were certain perceptions that still dominate. And this idea that academia is in an echo chamber um, on its own, um, as, opposed to, as opposed to being you know, out there. I, I, I wonder sort of how, how do you answer a question like that? Um, and, and, and because it's about the security sector. I mean, Joanna, you mentioned that you, you already do so much work with them, but, um, but you know, Jenny, you've been in, the, in, in these policy spaces. How, how does that, how does, how, what's the, what are the issues there? Um, and what are the misperceptions that, that the question itself might, might um, imply? Well, I think that there is a risk of an echo chamber uh, in any circle. Um, and, you know, there's so many people who are so deeply committed and active um, who kind of bring such richness and inspiration and so on. But I'm not entirely convinced that WPS is yet mainstream in most circles. Um, and I think that to tackle that, you know, we need to continue to reach out. Um, we need to be pragmatic, I think, in many ways. Um, so bringing the evidence, you know, that people want rather than necessarily the evidence we think um, um, might be most suited. Um, so we, you know, need to use whatever data is available to do, try and do some quantitative analysis. If they want quantitative analysis, we need to bring voices as well. I think we need to use a variety of tools to make the work kind of timely and accessible uh, themes that um, Tarun and others have already spoken about. And I think we also should be frank that the actual progress in terms of the commitments in 1325 and the subsequent resolutions has really been quite abysmal um, on quite basic aspects. And for example, even um, the involvement of women in peace negotiations, uh, we published a paper, we're about to publish a paper on this, picking up from reporting by UN women, but it went up and then it fell again. <laughs> you know, so, and it didn't even get that high. It's, it was still below 30%. And then now it's back in the teens. So we can't, you know, progress is not linear. Um, and I think kind of holding um, decision makers to account um, on basic aspects, as well as kind of deeper and um, probably more important aspects, you know, in terms of chronic uh, underlying structural drivers, all of those things are important. But I think the good news for the, the burgeoning kind of scholars and others, and the chat box has been fascinating, I'm not sure how we're going to get through it all, is that there is a very long list of things to do, um, which is great for scholars and for students. Um, and I think um, so exciting to see the ways in which people are tackling, um, you know, these really thorny uh, problems. And um, I, I think Jackie's students have been very well trained, even if she's excited by the ways in which they react. But I think, you know, the, the, the insights, um, you know, the sharing of insights um, and then bringing that forth with the new technologies and, and skills that we have, um, I think all go well for the future. But I think we do need to be kind of frank about, um, you know, how much there is still to do, including on quite um, fundamental aspects of, uh, of the agenda. Thank you. Joanna, um, uh, Jackie mentioned this question of, you know, maybe we, we don't necessarily change the attitudes, but there are behavior changes. And again, you work with these guys um, and it's about, uh, and, and they're military, so they're very well disciplined about what they should do and, it, you know, and what they shouldn't do. Where do you see, um, where do you see kind of the, the opportunities or the tactics or strategies that work um, around getting that behavior change or getting that attitude change? And where do you see kind of resistance that, that, that comes up? Because, um, you know, sometimes I, I, I think I, I've been in trainings with, with military personnel and, it, you know, when their own heart, you know, we think a lot about the intellectual dimensions and giving the evidence, 
but actually it is the stories and it is the experiential aspects of it when they meet a woman in women in Darfur who tell them what's going on that that suddenly opens their eyes up to, to the reality and the complexity so I'm just wondering kind of as as you talk to them what are the what are the issues around how you shift behavior what are the incentives for shifting behavior but then also kind of you know intellectually where 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 do you um where do you see the, the blockages if, if you want in terms of changing practice um I think militaries all over are about the same. Um, it's command. It's, it's, it's a system that works. There's, there's, a, there's a hierarchical system and it, it allows the system to work. It flows from the top down. And so that's how you keep the structure in place. And um, a lot of times I always tell militaries all over that, you know what, it, it's top down. So the, the, the change must happen at the top. And when it happens at the top, it, it will flow down to the bottom. That's how the any, any security agency works. It's not just the army, it's the police, it's the customs, it's immigration. It's how security agencies are structured. It's how command is and um, respect is, it's, 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 it's part of the system. But I think what peacekeeping has offered and what peacekeeping has offered, especially the militaries and the police globally is the, the nature of atrocities that they have encountered in peacekeeping has changed attitude. And the stories they have encountered, as I said, for some of them, some of the stories has, I mean, and look, I, I've listened to people and they have recounted some of the stories they've heard. And they, they, they're not able to, and as I said, it's secondary trauma for them. They're not able to even comprehend it themselves. And for some of them, they, 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 they say, how does a human being do this to another human being? How, how do you do this to a child? How do you do this to a woman? How do you do this to a man? And for them, that's enough to just, it's enough to change their mind. And, and it's enough for them to sit in a class when they're talking about sexual and gender-based violence and that, that someone who has not been on a peacekeeping mission to, 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 to shrug their shoulder and say, you wait, when you are put in the theater, you understand what she's talking about. And they take over the class and they give their own example of South Sudan. They give their own example of Lebanon. They give their own example of what it's, they give their own example of what they have heard and what they have seen. And the fact that they were just 30, 30 kilometers away from um, um, a town that rebels had, had hijacked or a kid uh, had hijacked for two days and they were not able to intervene. And, and the whole town was, I mean, the women in the town were raped. And they give their own stories of, of, of what they saw when we're finally able to intercept and move in and what happened in that town. And they're able to now replay what had happened to the women and the girls in, 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 in that situation or what the terrorists did or what the rebels did. And they're able to now say the stories that they themselves saw. This wasn't told to them by the victims or the survivors. They, they saw it themselves. And they're able to now say it and they say, look, she's not making up the story. They are not making up these stories. These are things that we saw, these are things that we heard. And so it changes, something in you changes. And I think that's, that's one of the things that peacekeeping and peace of operations have been able to change a bit. And it's able to change their own perceptions and their own understanding of the, of, of the theater. And, and um, it changes not only attitude, but also changes perception and behavior. And they are able to come back into their own countries and be able to now transfer that information and knowledge to those about to also go and also prepares them. And I think that is where, without you even giving the research, it also goes back to also now tell the armies that you need to also prepare your personnel before they go into mission and also prepare them when they come and also have in place mechanisms when they come back to treat them and to have support services for them themselves when they come back into mission. So yes, I think Jackie mentioned the issue about changing behavior. Behavior change is important. Language. I, I think I said this when we were talking about the prep meeting that at times even the words that are used by those on top can change attitude and can change the, the, the kind of behavior that the personnel themselves also exhibit when they are not only in mission but also out of mission. So the, the, the issue of changing attitude is important, but behavior, the language that is used, and I think I think Jackie mentioned communication. Communication in terms of the personnel we, we put out in the mission is important, 
but also the communication of, of the, I mean, from your side, the students and the, the practitioners, it's also very important. And getting people to understand that the words we use, the, the language we, 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 we give out is key in ensuring that we give out the right message, we send out the right, the, the right words, the, the right communication, the right, the, the right phrases and the right sentences, the right communicate. I mean, the right words are used at, at all times to ensure that the message that will be sent out uh, are what it is that we want to see. And I think, um, yeah, behavior and attitude are key for us at, at, at our side to ensure that the messages that we, we, we keep out, we, we put out all the time is, is what we want to ensure for, for us in the system that we work, which is at the very top down system, it, it um, works all the time for us, yeah. Thank you. And, and it's, I, I, I completely agree. I, I feel like so often it's the experiential aspect. It's like once you've seen it and felt it and met people or been in those contexts that you see how these things are so interrelated as, as it's been for all of us. Um, but, and, and then it's the exposure because so often we, when I talk about women doing peace building work on the ground in Yemen or Syria, I'm talking, you know, some audiences, they, they literally don't believe it because their, their own perception of Yemen or South Sudan or wherever is so set in their minds and they, they bring their own assumptions about societies and about specifically war-torn context. So to actually get them to get that shift to say, you know what, you know, and, and they're actually much more enabled, they're much more empowered than many of us because of the kinds of risks that they're taking. But it's your sort of, it's almost unreal for people sometimes. It's such a distance. There's the, the gap is so so big. And 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 so these the films, the stories, the the events, all of these things I think are, are very important. It's about exposure um, as well. We have a question from um, from the chat about, which kind of touches on some of these things, about the fact that um, like any other field as it's evolving and any other movement that 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 evolves. Um, there are tensions within the community. So we have tensions between scholars and practitioners or differences between scholars and practitioners, differences between the priorities that people come up with. So whether if you're an activist in a Western country or in the US, you may have certain priorities, but if you're in Nigeria dealing with Boko Haram, it may be very different. in terms of how you call and sorry did i lose you there for a second yeah um oh uh, yeah sorry i was just saying that that um this there's a question about how do we make sure that the agenda doesn't um progress in a way that is somehow colonized by English speaking Western or Northern academic institutions and, and the sort of scholarship around it, as opposed to um, really the, the, the richness that comes from so many perspectives and, and, and differences, both sectorally, but also geographically. Um, anybody wanna, wanna talk about the tensions and also, yes, I, I knew you, Jackie, I knew you. <laughs> yes, go for it. Um, well, uh, we're all human beings. So there's always going to be disagreements and differences and tensions and that's healthy and productive of new ideas and, and new creative approaches, uh, new ways of understanding peace, what peace is, what security is, what insecurity is. So I think that's all really, really valuable. And the fact that that's, you know, that we have those debates and growing debates in the broad field of women, peace and security is a positive, uh, you know, it suggests that it's becoming more, more mature. Um, you know, but um, in terms of, you know, kind of addressing, um, you know, exclusions like, um, you know, the, the, you know, perhaps elite discourses and, and focuses on only on the UN Security Council and the, and the global policy level and not the kind of changing practice on the ground, um, especially in, in the most, you know, con 
fragile and conflict affected areas. I think um, we do have a responsibility um, in the centres that we have established. Um, and we all do different things and, and some, you know, we have a bit of a comparative advantage. Um, but I think we, you know, with regard to that next generation, it is our responsibility to make sure that that next generation is as diverse and inclusive as possible. Um, and that means, uh, that means offering scholarships, that means really trying to, you know, train people from diverse backgrounds, um, diverse parts of the world. And it means ultimately for us all, mentoring and twinning other centers like our own so that they grow and multiply around the world. So, I mean, personally, that's my mission. Um, you know, I'm so excited this week about my fantastic Indonesian PhD students who are experts in their own right on gender, peace and security. Um, and they, um, you know, they were so excited to see Indonesia um, lead a resolution in the Security Council supporting women's presence and peacekeeping. Um, and I know in their careers, they are gonna make great strides in their country. So I'm really proud that Monash Gender Peace and Security Center can help in the mentoring um, and the mainstreaming of that knowledge in Indonesia. So that's just one example, um, but I think it has to be sort of our, our commitment and all of us, uh, I, I think are doing that in different ways. Anyone else wanna tackle that question of, of the kind of, yes, jo uh, Joanna, go ahead, of course. I think I do agree with Jackie on that. I think there has to be a conscious effort by the global north to put in, um, I think what one, I mean, our consortium is one example of having coming to, I think Jackie mentioned earlier on about having a network of persons who come together and continue to work together towards the agenda. But I think there has to be a conscious effort among the, the, the actors to look at where the, um, where the agenda is going, but also to look at where the, the practitioners are. Because currently there seems to be um, um, a concentration of the researchers in one area and practitioners in one area. And there needs to be, I think when we, we, we talked about the challenge, there needs to be a better fusion of the practitioners and the, and, and the, uh, and the researchers, where we translate the research into practice. Into practice. And, and we need to make the research a bit more accessible to the practitioners so that it doesn't seem to be um, a, a competition between the theory and the practice, because at the end of the day, the research should lead to practice. And there should there, there be, I remember when, when, when I was doing research, my, 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 uh, my boss used to say that policymakers do not read 40 page documents. It, it's beautiful to have a 40 page document, but the people who are going to use that document will not have the time to read the 40 page document. So be sure that once you finish it, turn it into a two page document that the policy person will be able to take it. And when they are in their vehicle, moving from meeting A to meeting B, they can skim through it and pick their salient points and be able to talk about it when they get to their next meeting. And so imagine you have the chance to meet the secretary general and he's going, he's walking from his office to the next meeting and he needs to read your documents before he gets to the next meeting. So turn that 40 page document or that, that occasional paper into something that he can read quickly. So we need to be able to turn these fantastic papers that we do into something that he can read before he, he gets to his next meeting. And that's what the practitioners need. So all the documents that we read, that we, 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 we publish and we turn out, which are wonderful papers, need to be able to also become accessible for the practitioners who most of the time are not in the North, in the global North, but in global South, and be able to now use that information to be able to become practitioners, I mean, the, the practical work that they need, to, they need to be able to use. And that's why I think we need to do, put more work into. And I think there's a lot of questions in, in, in the, the Q&A from a lot of students who are asking us, what do we do with our, our PhDs? What do we do with our masters? When we finish school, what do we do with it? And many of them are not going to become academics. I'm going to academia. Many of them are not, will not become academics. They want to go into the field. They want to become practitioners. What do, that, what, what do we do with our work out of school that will still make us impactful and, 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 and see us contributing towards the agenda? And that is where I think we need to start moving a bit from. The research is great and it's wonderful, but beyond that, we need to be able to say that from the research, 
we are moving into the field. And a lot of the work that we do, I think Sanam has alluded a lot to this, goes to the grassroots. Uh, but a lot of these grassroots women are not going to be reading a lot of the work that we do. But they needed those information to be able to use that effectively in the work that they do in the grassroots. So how do we, and I think going, I think there's a question there about going forward. I think that's a question that we all have to look forward to. How do we move the research from the research work into the, the woman in, 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 in my village and in the Sanams, wherever it is, that they be able to use that information to be able to help those women that they have in that, in that work. And I think that's where the question for me, as I sit through listening to all that we're saying, how do we move the work from our research, the research work that I've done to help the woman in my village? To be able to now all in, in the in as it was called Abuko Haram or Nigeria, a village in Nigeria, to be able to now use that information, which is very relevant information for her, or to now use that information to guide the people there to be able to do the work that they need to do in a more effective way. So I think that's the question that keeps running through my head as we keep talking throughout. And I think I think I think that it's, it's that's all, that's also my experience that um, I started making animations um, a few years ago because because it was. I, number one, the policymakers were saying, you know, they don't read things. And so we were saying, okay, here's a five minute video, you know, with images. And, and also our brain takes on images better than it does. And then once we started making them, you know, if you, if you, if you have to explain issues with pictures and very few words, you really have to get rid of the jargon. You can't say gender sensitive ceasefire. You have to say, what does that actually look like on the ground, right? And then what are the pictures? And once we started doing that, I then it, it was very much this this issue of when you when you say going back to the grassroots, the grassroots is living with this, right? They they so so it was much more about saying what's the experience that they have? How do we bring it into and 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 communicate it in a way that resonates with them, but is also resonating that kinds of issues and ideas that 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 you know we we talk about when we're saying inclusion, and um and then we did that. And then we realized, well, it's really relatively cheap to translate. So now all of a sudden you can have it in local languages and you can give it back to people in their own language, makes, which makes a difference. And at the same time, at, at, you know, at, at the Department of Political Affairs um, at the UN, I remember the, the former um, head at some point said, Though that image from that cartoon, it's still in my head. And I was like, wow, it's, it's just a different, you know, there's knowledge and then there's the transfer of knowledge and that, kind of again all of all of us where we sit matter it's the the, the academic side matters the grassroots side matters the in-between connectivity the think tanks and and where we bring these worlds together all of it matters as long as we understand that it is for the service of those women in the village who are really living the reality and i, th I think that's the piece that i that we have to keep um bringing it back to that that from research it has to to what extent is it applied research and, and what, are the, what are the relationships? And I wonder and you know, again, going to uh, publications that we have, but how to stop sexual violence in um can you hear me am i am i still there yeah um how do we you know how do you stop sexual violence in refugee camps or in in humanitarian city all the research all the recommendations and then these recommendations aren't being taken up and i wonder whether there's research to be done about what Apologies, everybody. We seem to have lost Sanam again. Um, I'm going to turn to a question from the chat, uh, I think. Maybe maybe bring it back to, to where we are right now. Um, it's quite a simple question. It's been directed to Jenny, but I think everybody can answer it. Maybe Jenny looks at it first. How will the pandemic affect gender equality? What happens in it? Did I lose you again? Um, so the, que the question is, yeah.
the research is there, all these recommendations. Would you like me to go ahead? Mm. I think the short answer is badly. Um, so, you know, I think there's, I think this is a, actually a good example of timely um, monitoring and research bringing um, kind of major issues to the fore, uh, highlighting, for example, the impacts of women on women who work in the informal sector, uh, the increase uh, incidents of violence in the home, um, many more women being laid off, uh, including in rich countries because they work in occupations which have been most badly affected uh, by the pandemic. Um, and then I also noticed questions, um, and I, so I think in many ways it's exposing pre-existing inequalities rather than uh, creating new sources of inequality, uh, but clearly bringing those in, to the fore. So here I think the challenge is to think about ways of reimagining the future. And Andrade Roy actually is the person who I've seen put this most eloquently, um, to move out of the pandemic into a new world in ways uh, which is totally different uh, to that um, which existed before. So it's not about um, establishing the old normal, you know, it's, it's, it's about building things differently. And I think that that applies in so many spheres, in, including in this one. Um, so, you know, I think trying to work out what can be done both in the short term um, to combat the most egregious and immediate impacts, uh, including in terms of protection, income assistance and so on, and then working out ways in which we can learn from this to avoid um, kind of uh, similar um, crises in the future, I think is very important. Uh, I think this is one area where we actually learnt from pa past crises in, in West Africa and what happened <clears throat> with the Ebola crisis. And that's very much informed kind of thinking about increased risks uh, during during the current pandemic. Yeah, I I, um, I agree with you. I think this is a big opportunity. At the same time, you know, one of the things that we see, whether it's with COVID or with what happened in Lebanon, is that institutions kind of go. You know, there's a certain muscle that comes into play when crisis, they just do the same thing. So one of the things that, that's come out of the Lebanon uh, crisis, uh, explosion is that the women's movement there is saying they were on the ground, they were doing the response, they're doing all this work. And as usual, the international community suddenly swoops in, um, collects all the money, but is actually not transferring it down and enabling the work, uh, the, the, those, those locals. So, so, so there is there are some fundamental major institutional changes that need to happen around dealing with crisis. And COVID, I think, showed us that local resilience is really critical and local capacities are really critical. But, but um, you know, in some ways, this is a conflict of interest because if it's resources going down to the ground, it means it's not resources going into the big institutions. And, 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 I, and again, I wonder whether within academia there is, or within, within our world of applied work, whether there's a space for having conversations around how do you fix, how do we kind of find the common ground to really enable the comparative advantages of different sectors, as opposed to the, the same things happening over and uh, over again, especially from, from, from a gendered lens that, that we're still chasing as much as we know, we, we're still st sort of still having to remind them that there was a gender dimension um, to this work. Jackie, did, have you had any of that? Yeah, I remember you said something about working with your own colleagues and, and we're being surprised about this. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that Jenny has said with regard to the ways in which COVID is exacerbating existing gender inequalities. But um, for a moment, I might like to say that there's a bit of a silver lining to the COVID pandemic. And perhaps that's because I've already been in lockdown for two months and have to face another two months of it. I need to be positive. Um, but I do think this crisis has like made visible women as essential workers. Uh, women who are working, caring for other people um, and how important care is. And it's also made visible women as effective leaders 
as effective leading governments. And I think that's so important and that is the new normal and we need to build on that. And one of the things, and, and with my colleagues at Monash University, I mean, we have used this crisis to create an experiment and um, a sort of a natural experiment and to bring together all the different disciplines to look at the impact of COVID-19 on the city of Melbourne, but also with an eye to not just building back better, but to achieving the sustainable development goals. Um, you know, actually to having a livable city that actually um, meets those goals by 2050. Um, and what that has enabled as a lot of conversations in, I mean, as Jenny said earlier, it's forced us to talk to the skeptics about why the shadow pandemic um, with regard to domestic and gender-based violence is happening, why, it, why that type of violence probably won't go away after this pandemic, um, but why it's important to think about gender-based violence, even when you are you know, planning your public transport system, or you are thinking about how to conserve water. Um, uh, and you know, even when you're thinking about you know, the health and well-being of people working in hospitals. So all of these issues have a gender and a security, um, gender and security dimension. If we understand security as, as really being about the well-being of all people. So that's been really, really fascinating. And I have been really confronted by the fact that my colleagues, really intelligent, brilliant people, um, really don't have a perspective on gender inequality at all. Um, and I think, um, you know, I'm learning a lot and I have to say that, you know, it's not just a one way thing. There's a lot that we're all learning. And I think perhaps, you know, that's important in a crisis is that if we're going to create a new normal, um, we do need to actually collaborate with others, you know, who don't agree with us, who have a different expertise. Um, and, um, you know, we need to do women, peace and security differently as well. Um, so I think that's an exciting opportunity and we can see all sorts of similar types of experiments and um, movements around the world, um, you know, which are bridging the local and the global, the disciplines, you know, the institutions. So, um, yeah, I, I think it, it's a positive in the context of a very dire situation for you know the whole world so on that i have we have a few minutes we have about eight minutes left and i have sort of clusters of questions that have that have come through um one is just to pick up jackie from where you are about you know how do we make sure that that we don't and and, and i for me on a personal level coming into this always kind of with a foot in some acad in academic research but always with a sort of, you know, practice and grassroots and civil society and, and policy work. I found this very often that, um, how do we make sure that the knowledge that is produced in non-academic settings, whether it's NGOs, whether, and it's very often, it's very, very good research and it's, it's, it's in a way more pioneering than academic research because of, of, of the links to practice, but whether it's in the NGO sector or whether it's in policy institutions, how do we make sure that that knowledge is not kind of treated as second class uh, citizen, you know, the gray literature type of a thing, um, and that is, is, is as valued and um, as drawn upon as opposed to just uh, the very pure sort of, you know, was that, you know, stuff that gets published in, in, you know, academic journals that most, a lot of people just don't have access to. So that's one question. A second question, which is kind of an interesting is um, what, you know, what are the issues or challenges around the notions of toxic masculinity that the WPS field has created. I, I actually challenge the assumption that we have created toxic masculinities. I, 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 at least what I've found is that this space has allowed us to open up the world and look at the human experience. And as I say, in the same way that we think about um, women as, as being victims or experiencing war, we're looking at men's experiences of, of war in all its, in, in, and the vulnerabilities that men also face. So I'm, I'm not sure necessarily that this, that we are responsible for creating toxic masculinities, but the question of masculinity is coming in. And then the final question, which I think is, is kind of, in a way, a great, good, way, good way to also wrap up your thoughts is, what is our advice for the younger generation, especially people who are working on youth, peace and security coming into this field, 
Um, how do they get their foot in the door? Um, and uh, what can they learn from our work? But also it ties in with um, what would be advice to your younger self, maybe? So, so if you know, I, I always say I was young when I started this. So, so <laughs> it's, you know, it was feeting, but but um, but what you know? So, so any of those three questions uh, uh, in terms of the in terms of your just uh, closing remarks. Um, thank you. And I might turn off my video because of the unstable internet here in Washington. Can I start, Sanam, or did you did you pass it on to Jackie first? No, no, yeah, you, yeah, it's, it's go for a turn. No, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking that the first question, what do we do with the knowledge, uh, the wealth of knowledge that there is uh, within civil society organizations and, 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 uh, and NGOs? Um, I can only speak for, for, my, for myself and, and from Prio's perspective, but what we have done uh, in recent years is that we have established more and more collaboration with at least the Norwegian NGOs. Um, having a close dialogue with them. It's, it started really out with an op-ed some years back where one of my colleagues were really question, questioning, so where do you get your numbers from? Claiming that this number of women are, you know, impacted by war here and this number of children are dying from war and conflict here. Where do you get your numbers from? And it, it, and it, it created a, a, a heated debate in, in, in Norway. But then we tried to be constructive. So we, we invited everyone to a dialogue. And since then, we have had a number of projects and collaboration where we try to gather the information, the data that the civil society organizations have collected over the years and help them to systematize it and, and write it up uh, both as academic publications, but also very practically oriented policy oriented publications and this has been very successful and very well received by, by policymakers for instance uh, and if i should jump to my concluding um, uh, remarks about uh, I, I think i would like to pick the one the advice to the to to the younger me <laughs> i think um the advice would be um well i'm glad that i didn't know how difficult it would be <laughs> That it should take such a long time. So, so I'm glad that I didn't know that. But uh, based on what I know now, uh, the advice would be think much more strategically. Uh, you, I think it was you, Sanam, who were talking about uh, that we really need to grasp the politics of things. Uh, we need to understand how policies are made and who's the actors and how to 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 collaborate with different groups of actors. And also find yourself a really good mentor. Someone, someone you can discuss with and exchange views with, and preferably one more senior who has been living for a while and has uh, gone through different hurdles. And that has been really important for me to have someone more senior to discuss with. Uh, and I realized that a little bit too late. So that would be a, an advice from from my side. Thank you. I agree, and 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 I think people are looking for mentors. So I think I think within our institutions, if if there is a willingness, I, th I think that that, yeah. that makes a, a a big difference. Um, and definitely the politics. Anybody else want to jump in on on any of these two questions and 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 your closing remarks, frankly? Joanna. Um, I think the question about. Okay, the question about how do we ensure that the, the research from non-academic institutions are still not regarded as um, second class, that's not that's a question, right? I mean, I work for a typically non, well, we were not officially an academic institution until not too long ago. So I think there is a, um, I think my earlier comments about having the, the collaboration and the partnership, it's, it, it's key in, in, in this regard. We, we, we need to respect the, the, the various actors in the field. We need, to, we need to understand, I think you mentioned this Anam earlier on about the fact that there is, there, there is a place for every actor in, 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 in this agenda. And there's a need to, to see where each one fits in the puzzle and, and see the role that everyone plays in this puzzle and, and appreciate what everybody brings on board and be able to see where everybody fits in the puzzle and, and, and recognize that and, and utilize every player I mean, sorry, I'm going football here, the soccer here. But I utilize every player and, and the strength they bring onto the table and, and, and make use of it. So wh wherever the data is coming from, make use of it, see where it fits and, and analyze it effectively. Whether it is from an, a purely academic institution or a tech tank or a policy, a policy institution, it has value. 
and at times they actually have more access to those on the ground than you, the academic institutions may. And so they may be able to get you some information that you may not be able to get as an, as an academic institution. What would I tell my younger self? Well, I think I'm the youngest on the platform right now, so my younger self is still younger. Um, but in terms of um, my younger self, um, I think I, I do agree with what Torin said. Um, I'm still learning this, but be patient. Um, don't go in there blazing, um, gun blazing. It's, it's, you, you have, I'm still learning this. The, the politics of it is very, it's, it's very, it's very thick. You have to go in very, very strategically. You have to learn, understand the politics of it. And you have to know who, and I think uh, something Torrance have that's, have someone who can mention your name at the table so that the, your name can be mentioned and be able to help you navigate the, the, the channels because there are channels that you don't understand. There are, there, there, are, there are tables that you don't know are there and there, there, are, there, are, there are hoops and hurdles that you have no idea have been placed there. So you are entering a field that you don't understand. You don't, you, you, you need people to hold your hand, hold, open your eyes, hold your feet, basically carry you through. And so it's very, 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 very important to have people who have been there. I mean, the agenda is 20 years. Um, Beijing is 25, but trust me, it's, it's older than that. It's, it's 100 years old. And there are people who have been in it for 100 years and are still in it. So you need to know the people who are older than you, who understand it, who appreciate it, who have fought the battles and are, have wounds and, and scars for it. And so you need to have people who understand it and can guide you and show you who to avoid. Not who to avoid, but who to, who to greet, as we say in my country, who to greet and, and who to smile and who to, and how to smile and how to nod. And so be patient. You won't have the results today. And as I said, the agenda is older than 25 years old. You will see, you may not see all the results that you want to see in the next five years. But as, as, as has been said, it's a long journey ahead of you. It's a longer journey ahead of us. So be patient with yourself and be, 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 be ready to, to not always see the results you want to see. But be ready to celebrate the, the, the smallest victories. And when you see the smallest victories, celebrate it very, 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 very much. And be happy for it. Yeah, I'm gonna because of time. I'm gonna to go to our other colleagues, but I, but I, I think, uh, I think, I think that that's uh, that's great. Knowing the history, I think, is so important because it's so often erased. And and I, I always, I'm like Bertha von Suttner was the inspiration for the Nobel Peace Prize, and she's been erased. Out. So get to know her, and then from there you can you can uh, build up. But um, uh, Jenny and Jackie, last last thoughts um, on on any of these questions, and you know, advice to your younger self or 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 to to the folks coming into youth peace and security. Well, that was so eloquent from Joanna. Uh, I hope that uh, we can we can keep that. I think there are some really important insights there about kind of negotiation and um, uh, kind of navigating um, and difficult to beat. I mean, I guess my result to um, my kind of insights for a younger self is, is very much around um, kind of being more savvy um and being strategic but not being overly strategic <laughs> you know i think that you know there's, there's a balance there as well so we want to be relevant uh we want to make change um but as joanna so importantly said these issues are, are centuries old um and so kind of thinking about the long game i think is important as well um and i, I guess the only other thing i would kind of highlight um and i think that I did this kind of through my career, um, but I think it's important is alliances and building bridges, you know, and being able, getting outside the echo chamber, you know, maybe you don't want to listen to Fox News, but, you know, it's important to be kind of understanding kind of diverse perspectives. Um, I think that the sharper kind of impetus now on diversity kind of within the group is important, but I think diversity, understanding where people are coming from, um, and helping to kind of bridge the dialogue um, is very important. And again, it may not bring short-term results. It may be some small victories, as, as Joanna said, that should be celebrated. But um, keeping, keeping an eye on the long game is uh, very important. And thanks so much to everyone. 
Jackie? Uh, tough acts to follow, but um, just just a few more comments. And, and just with regard to how do we uh, recognize the knowledge produced in non-academic areas. Um, and I think, um, I think feminist scholars have been really good at this. Um, and I think of Cynthia Enlow, you know, encouraging us for probably three or four decades to cite, you know, to, to cite the newsletter from the grassroots women, um, you know, equally, you know, really to diversify and expand the sources of your knowledge and your research. And that's so crucial right now um, with the challenge of climate change. Uh, and I think those at the grassroots who are actually, you know, themselves working to, you know, prevent, mitigate, adapt, um, to climate change, um, they have tremendous knowledge. And so we do need to, um, to be able to collaborate with them to, um, to cite those perspectives and, and uh, to, you know, to bring them into the forums which we have access to, but also to create new, new forums where, where you know, different types of actors um, can come together. Um, and I think that's the great thing about universities. And I'm going to put a pitch there um, because I think they are these kind of independent, relatively neutral places where we can bring different groups together in a safe way. Um, so I'm committed to that. Um, my younger self, yeah, it feels only like just like yesterday. I don't know about the rest of you, <laughs> kind of what happened to the last three decades. Um, well, I have no regrets. But what I have learned, I try to pass on to my kids and they simply don't listen. So for what it's worth, I think turning up is half the job, like being there, being in the room, getting in the room. <laughs> it's really, really important. Um, that might mean scaling a barbed wire fence, whatever it takes, being there is really important, turning up. Um, and I think everything, you know, just to echo all of the other points made, building alliances, making all the friends you can. And when you're young, you have such a great opportunity. Um, you know, talk to the people who don't have the same backgrounds as you. Um, even though we can't travel, well, at least I can't travel, but most of us can't travel at the moment, I really say understand the world firsthand, you know. So that's... Go uh... places. Yeah. So these are great points to to end on and um and i hope that um the audience has uh appreciated are we done um uh, but thank you very much I, th I think we're over time so so we're kind of being kicked off our our slot uh, but really lovely to have you next week the lse will be launching on the 13th the uh, new frontiers and in, in women peace and security event so please look out for that and uh and thank you all for this really great conversation this week. Um, it will be online and available and uh, uh, you can download it and watch it as well. Thank you very much and talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.